Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to day two of our World Ovarian Cancer Coalition partner meeting. I'm Clara McKay, CEO of the coalition, and I very much look forward to the program and all of your contributions. We had an excellent start yesterday. We covered a wide range of issues and topics that were equal parts informative, inspiring, and challenging. We had some pro provocative conversations about the kind of global approach we need to ensure that all women diagnosed with ovarian cancer, wherever they may be in the world, have the best chance of survival and the best quality of life possible. We shared our plans with you to undertake in partnership with IGCS, a version of the Every Woman Study in low and middle income countries, an initiative that will go such a long way to give us the evidence we need to account for the experiences of women and those that treat them in these settings. And we asked an important question about why does this matter? The answer is it matters very much. Projections show that the burden of ovarian cancer is set to significantly rise globally. And importantly, these increases are much more significant in middle and low income regions around the world. During the treatment mapping session, we shared research that the coalition has undertaken that looked at availability and access to 15 different ovarian cancer treatments across 13 countries spanning high to low income. The outcome of this work paints a stark and shocking picture in relation to availability and access. Outside of high income countries, there is often meager access to even most basic treatments. And in some places like Zambia, no treatments on our list were at all available. It also shows worryingly that women in low and middle income countries are much more likely to be paying out of pocket for more than half of the drugs on our list. Whereas in high income countries, the state seems to appears to pay for about 75 of the treatments on the list, or 75% rather. Given that 70% of women with ovarian cancer are in lower income countries, this highlights just how financially devastating a diagnosis of cancer can be we know in many cases, these treatments will be beyond the reach of most women. So it matters very much. It matters very much that those of us with an interest in global health equity are concerned about how we address these, address these deficiencies. And it is not to say that only women living in low and middle income countries face challenges. As our colleagues from Ovarian Cancer Canada showed in their excellent presentation on the findings of their Canadian version, of the study, there are challenges for women everywhere. I was especially struck by some of the testimonials from women who contributed to the study about their diagnosis. I very much like the way they highlighted the notion of the good short and bad short diagnosis. We need to do better for all. I am sure during the course of today, we will return to these important discussions. We were also delighted yesterday to share with you our plans for World Ovarian Cancer Day 2022, our 10th anniversary of a campaign that started from humble beginnings but has grown in leaps and bounds, now engaging 18 million people worldwide. Our theme for 2022 and for the next three years is No Woman Left Behind. Reflecting on the growth of the day, we happily acknowledge that we, the coalition, only provide the tools and the real work gets done by you. But importantly, we have seen engagement in World Ovarian Cancer Day grow exponentially across the whole community. It's a campaign that is no longer just driven by the World Ovarian Co Cancer Coalition, by patient advocates, by patient advocacy organizations. We see everyone from clinicians, researchers, policymakers, and industry embrace the opportunity to raise awareness of ovarian cancer. The standout moments for me from, were the presentations from our colleagues in Italy and Ireland, and how for both the real wins came from collaboration. In Italy, with patients, experts, health professionals, and celebrities, coming together to create a powerful campaign that will carry on beyond the day. And I love the story from Ireland about how starting out in 2013, they had one building lit up in Teal. Today, I am sure that on May 8th, 
the team at the International Space Station can see a glowing beacon of teal that hovering over Ireland. But I also love that this collaborative approach has resulted in the establishment of a formal network in Ireland of patient advocates, patient advocacy organizations, and clinicians. And it all started with a single teal light. Our workshops on social media skills and inclusivity were incredibly well attended and feedback has been extremely positive. In their own way, each of these workshops address the challenge of how we can reach more people, how we can be more engaging with more people worldwide in ways that are effective, but also appropriate to all of those impacted by this disease. For me, the biggest takeaway from yesterday was that it always came back to the power of collaboration, of partners and partnerships between patient advocates and clinicians, organizations and people, building powerful alliances and working gathered together to drive change. It is a principle that we at the coalition live by. Looking to today, I expect you will see the same quality of insight and discussion as yesterday. We kick off this first session on clinical insights, and I expect that in that session, we will return to some of the themes that I've highlighted above. But I also think we will be come away from that session with optimism. We do have some promising treatments that are being used now, and that hopefully have, an, have even more promise moving forward. Our challenge is to ensure that every woman with ovarian cancer can access treatments uh, in, uh, that work for them. I am excited that we will be sharing our World Ovarian Cancer Coalition plans for, with you. And I am really excited that we will be hearing from colleagues in the US, Finland and Portugal about their plans for the future. We are also repeating the two excellent workshops, both of which are very, very much worth attending. And of course, we are delighted that we will end the day with our impact awards ceremony, more than 10 very worthy recipients in this very first year of our awards program. So before I hand over to start the first session, I'd like to thank our sponsors and event supporters. Thank you again for your support and not just your support today, but for all that you do. It's also worth reminding people that all of these sessions from yesterday and today will be available to watch on demand after the meeting is over, likely from next week. So let's make a start. It is my great pleasure to introduce Claudia Hammond, BBC health reporter, author, and T radio and TV presenter. Claudia, thank you so much for joining us and I'm gonna hand over to you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to chair this uh, session today. It is sure to be fascinating. Uh, so I present Health Check and The Evidence, which are both radio programmes and podcasts um, from the BBC World Service. And across the week, we're lucky enough to have 97 million listeners to the station around the world. So over the past decade, I've been able to watch as different health issues come to the fore. Now, at the moment, of course, we've been talking a lot about the pandemic. I, I counted, I think, uh, that I did my 131st programme on COVID this week. But one of the topics we have covered again and again over the years is cancer and the rising incidence in low and middle income countries. And I think it's interesting that how attention is turning back again towards uh, cancer as the pandemic uh, progresses and, and hopefully moves on. Now, ovarian cancer, we know, doesn't always get the same attention as other forms of cancer. And I know that all of you are working hard to try to make sure that patients do get the care that they need. Now, this session is a chance to hear about the very latest developments in ovarian cancer and to keep you up to date with the research that's been presented at medical conferences and meetings, which have still been happening, of course, in the past year. And also, it's an opportunity for us to consider what impact progress in treatments will have for patients around the world and for the medical staff uh, working with them. Now, later on, we're going to have a panel discussion and time for your questions, too. So do be thinking what you would like to ask. But before that, Robert Coleman, who is a gynecologic oncologist at the University of Texas and chair of the International Gynecologic Cancer Society, has recorded a presentation for us covering the standout moment 
moments that we need to know about. And he will also be here to talk to us afterwards as well. It's worth noting that the data in the graphs near the start is US data. Now, that's not global data. It is US data. So it's, it's worth noting that. But let's have a look at Robert Coleman's video. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dr. Rob Coleman and I'm a gynecologic oncologist and the uh, Chief Scientific Officer for U.S. Oncology Research and also the current uh, President of the International Gynecologic Cancer Society. And it's a great pleasure to be with you today to speak about some, some of the highlights that have happened over the last 12 months from our annual meetings. Uh, these are my disclosures. So I always like to start with a slide like this because I think it helps to understand kind of what the global disease burden is. I think we feel, I think we understand kind of what it is, but, but it's hard to understand or appreciate what the real burden of disease is by just looking at incidence and, and uh, mortality rates. And these are identified here by this gold and these um, uh, maroon um, lines. And you can see over the last 20 years that there's been a slow decline uh, incidence and uh, to uh, uh, in mortality that has basically paralleled. But what's uh, what, but what is interesting here though is that we've seen and you can see this green curve represents an increase in disease prevalence. Now prevalence is the number of women who have ovarian cancer at any one time, and this has actually increased despite the fact that the incidence has decreased. So that's a little bit diff more difficult to kind of get your hands around unless you appreciate that patients are living much longer with the disease, uh, even though the rate of patients that are cured uh, doesn't seem to be uh, changing much um, over these last years. And we think that the reason for this has come from an expansion of our uh, therapeutic um, you know, toolbox that we're able to now uh, leverage across the whole spectrum of uh, the disease um, uh, natural history. And I've kind of placed the natural history here on this graphic where you can see that after, after the diagnosis that patients go through a series of chemotherapy and you can see that there's been an increase in the use of these uh, concomitant and maintenance therapies, um, which have now uh, started to populate our um, strategies in frontline and in the recurrent setting. And in the United States, uh, many women receive many lines of therapy uh, after progression. And so with these are also coming these concomitant and maintenance strategies that are extending the, the uh, duration of life, even after progression. So we think that this is contributing to that. And there's been two major uh, kind of classes of drugs that are, we think are responsible for this and kind of form the backbone of the therapy that is available to us in both the frontline and in the recurrent setting. And these are those, those particular drugs that target the formation of blood vessels, which support the natural growth of cancer. Uh, this is called angiogenesis and the identification of, these, of this new class of drug called the PERP inhibitors, which are responsible for uh, natural and normal repair of DNA, but when inhibited can take advantage of deficiencies within the cancer cell that are not present in the normal cell that could allow for um, uh, a, a, an event that hopefully leads to cancer cell death. Now, this has become a premium because we have learned now that if you look at the underlying molecular genetics of ovarian cancer, we find that there are a number of alterations uh, that are found in these tumors that are aligned with how the PARP inhibitors might work. And these are alterations, either mutations or, or methylation or um, amplification of specific factors that are related to the natural process of DNA damage repair. And because they're aberrant in almost half of the patients that have newly diagnosed ovarian cancer, these PARP inhibitors, which take advantage of this findings, uh, has become uh, really much more relevant in the, in the clinical domain. And if we take these two classes of drugs and we put the angiogenesis inhibitors and the PARP inhibitors and we kind of put them all together with respect to the trials that have been recently conducted, you can see by these bars uh, here that these, that, that each of these classes has, has generated some benefit, but in the population that is defined by the real vulnerability, so the tumors that have a mutation in BRCA or a mutation in other genes that are aligned with this, this um, DNA damage repair process have substantial benefit. And so you can see all these very long bars here going off to the right, 
representing the, the median or the middle part of a survivorship for patients who were, who were placed on these from these trials where women were randomized to either the PARP inhibitor or to uh, best um, uh, either a placebo or to the bevacizumab. And you can see that these, in all of these studies that there's a substantial gain. So we think that this is really part of the story that's leading to that extension in life uh, that we're seeing in the recent years. Now, with respect to some new information that was levied this year, there were a couple trials and I'll, I'll highlight them. One of them had to do with um, an observation that we realized many years ago, actually a decade since these data were published. And what we what we learned here, and these are what these are uh, curves. Are, if you're not familiar with, they're called are they're called mm -hmm. survival curves. And what they are representing is the proportion of patients who have not experienced a progression event. So you can see here at time zero, 100% of the patients have not received a progression event. And then you can see between these two arms of the curves, the yellow and the white. This, these were the patients who were randomized to the bevacizumab arm, and these are the patients who were randomized to the placebo arm for this for uh, the GOG218 trial. And over here on the right-hand side, we see uh, another trial that was looking at this drug bevacizumab, which again is an anti-angiogenesis drug, in a different study called ICON-7. And both of these trials basically came to the same conclusion. But on the bottom of these graphics, what you can see is that there seemed to be this effect that kind of maximized, oops, that maximized at the point of time while the patients were receiving the experimental agent. But when the experimental agent was stopped, then these curves kind of came back together. And we saw that in both of the studies. And so the question was, well, maybe we stopped too soon. So recently, recently there was a study that was um, presented called the BOOST trial, which was trying to take advantage of, or trying to address this question by doubling the bevacizumab. So instead of it being used for, for um, 15 months, it was used for 30 months. And so here are the, um, the randomization. So this particular uh, um, strategy is what we would consider the standard of care arm, and it was used for 15 months. This would be the experimental arm where it was doubled. And so they were looking to see whether or not we could extend um, outcomes by, by extending the duration of exposure of this drug. Unfortunately, we didn't, it didn't pan out. So in these curves, you can see again that they're overlapping essentially between these two arms and we did not see an improvement in progression-free survival or uh, in progression-free survival for uh, early stage, earlier uh, than metastatic stage, so the stage 2B to stage 3C. And we didn't see, um, uh, in, the, in that same group of patients who had residual tumor or stage four, so these would be considered high-risk patients, and we didn't see a difference in overall survival. Now, the good news is, is that um, we didn't see also any increase in toxicity, so we figured it was, it, we concluded it was safe to give, but it didn't have a, an impact on overall survivorship that we had hoped to see. So it was an important negative study, but addressing a very important question that we've been talking about for 10 years. So I thought that this was a reasonable um, you know, example of, a, of an ongoing trial that at least helps to us to know that using uh, this drug beyond its duration of time was not going to benefit patients and therefore shouldn't be done. So that was, I think, a, a positive benefit. Now, we in this in frontline ovarian cancer, we're doing a lot of work trying to add to this um, strategy. So I talked to you, I mentioned to you about bevacizumab. And I mentioned to you about the PARP inhibitors, which are listed here, but these studies are combining either two drugs here, you can see with the phenotrop or three uh, drugs in the first OB43, OB46. Uh, as, and these trials are all fully enrolled and hopefully over the next couple of years, will help us to answer those questions. So it's a very important um, trial in this development. Now for patients who have recurrent disease, obviously uh, there's a lot of of, of exploration, which is done here. And many of the strategies that we have shown that are beneficial in the frontline setting have come from showing their value in the recurrent setting. But in the current state of affairs, if the patients have had these drugs already in the frontline setting, are they still relevant here? And that was another uh, very important question. Well, we do have some information that came out about this concept. Um, we learned that if a patient had previously been exposed to the drug bevacizumab, which is an anti-angiogenesis drug, and was retreated with that drug when they recurred, there did not 
seemed to be a detriment. So we still saw a benefit to patients, actually almost identical amount, whether they have been exposed or not been exposed to BEV. So what we say is BEV after BEV um, was not a detriment and was so that was still a viable strategy. However, for PARP inhibitors, we did not see the same story. So in um, some work that was done a couple of years ago, we learned that if the patient had been on a PARP inhibitor and it stopped working, changing to a different PARP inhibitor was not gonna be successful. And so you can see here in this particular graphic that the number of patients who uh, gained any benefit was, oh, was zero essentially for retreatment. But it did raise the question that if you received a PARP inhibitor, let's say in a previous line of therapy and did not progress on it, could you reuse it? And the OREO trial, which was just presented a couple of weeks ago, was addressing this question. So it took patients who had previously had a PARP inhibitor and then they were retreated with a platinum-based therapy and had another response. And then they were randomized to using a, the PARP inhibitor Labrib or placebo. And it was broken down into two different cohorts, a, a, a cohort of patients who had a bracket mutation and a cohort of patients that did not have a bracket mutation. So this was a highly anticipated study. And interestingly, what it showed was that among patients that had uh, BRCA mutation in their tumors, that these patients appeared to benefit again when they got a bad, when they got the PARP inhibitor a second time. So in this particular instance, PARP after PARP was successful, and we saw this even in the patients who did not have a mutation in their in their tumor. So we saw a separation in these in these survival curves um, with uh, some of the patients gaining some benefit to retreatment. And when we looked at this across the various different subgroups that were enrolled in this trial, we found that there was a very consistent um, you know, report, result, uh, again, showing some confidence that we reuse these drugs if the patients demonstrated a uh, benefit. Now, there are some uh, important questions that have not been answered by this uh, trial. One of them has, is that in most, most of the patients who went on the study were receiving a PARP inhibitor for recurrent disease, and today, many patients are receiving a PARP inhibitor for, for, for frontline therapy. And so we don't have the same confidence yet. Uh, and, and that data has not been released yet, but we hope, this, hope, we hope that the same result will hold true for patients who have been on a PARP inhibitor in the frontline setting. Now, just kind of staying with PARP because this is such an important drug, there have been a couple of studies I'll just briefly mention that have been focused on ways to overcome this resistance that we see with some patients who have been previously treated with a PARP inhibitor. And these were two presented at ASCO. One was looking at the combination of a drug called adavacertib, which is a WE1 inhibitor. And the other one was uh, sorelacertib, which is an ATR inhibitor. And both of these are important aspects uh, or target important aspects of cellular division. So what we said in the first study called the EFFORT we looked at um, all patients that had a previous PARP inhibitor and progressed on it. And then they were either given this new drug called the Davisertib, which is a WE1 inhibitor alone or in combination with PARP. Now they weren't comparative studies, but they were looking to see if there was a response. And we saw that in all, in all of the patients treated, and it's a small study, that there was a response rate, an objective response to this retreatment. And when we, we looked at this in the patients who had had a, a tumor with a BRCA mutation, it was a little bit lower at 20%. And for those that had were wild type, there was a response rate of 30 to 40%. Okay, so this was actually quite, um, we were very enthusiastic about this because it represents as a, a strategy that we might be able to use these drugs again. Now they weren't a walk in the park. <laughs> there were some, we had a lot of delays and in the combination, we had a number of patients that required uh, stoppage between their treatments because of the toxicity. So we are continuing to work on the schedule here to see if we can take advantage of this activity by re but reducing some of the side effects. And the last study I'll just mention, or the second to last study I'll just mention briefly is this other strategy. And this is Sorelacertib, which is an ATR inhibitor. You don't need to be lost in all of this over here, but I'll, I'll just um, summarize by saying that ATR is one of the elements that leads to a successful repair of a double strand break in DNA. And of course, what we'd like to do is, is break that again so that the cancer cell can't recover from, from the, the development of a double strand break. So the combination made a lot of sense. And what we saw in a very preliminary study, just 13 patients, we did see these responses and all these patients had previously been treated with a PARP inhibitor. So again, we're very excited to see these initial signals that shows that we can safely administer these drugs 
and they do produce a, uh, a, a potential treatment effect. And the last mention is, and this is a very exciting new area called uh, an antibody drug conjugate. There's been a lot of excitement about this strategy for many years. Our initial attempts at this have not been so successful in ovarian cancer, but they've seen a lot of uh, treatment effect in breast cancer. There's this drug called amirituximab sorabtansine um, that uh, was being given in combination with uh, bevacizumab, an anti-angiogenesis drug. And of course, the way an antibody drug conjugate works is it targets something on the surface of the cancer cell and it gets inside the cell and then releases the warhead. So this is the, the, the chemotherapy agent. So it's kind of a targeted smart bomb, if you will. And what we saw with this combination were very high response rates in patients who had a high expression of the target that we're using the antibody to get to the cancer cell. 64% response rate is very high. We also saw that there was a long duration of response. So the patients who responded, responded almost for a whole year very, very exciting combination data. And again, it was very well tolerated uh, with some, 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 uh, some issues that we have with the eyes that require you know, attention to be pay, play, uh, placed on uh, uh, the eye toxicity. But again, uh, this has now been used in many patients and we're getting very good at controlling that adverse event. So overall, lots of neat things coming. Uh, there's more to the story. We learned something both negatively and positively in some of the recent studies but we're very, very excited about the direction this is, this is going, especially since we are now developing new strategies to deal with patients who have developed recurrence in the setting of, of some very effective frontline strategies. And so stay tuned to this channel because more will be coming in the near future. Really appreciate your attention and I hope you have a great conference. Thank you so much for that, uh, Robert. Thank you for taking the time to do that. And uh, Robert Coleman is joining us live now. Along with two other guests from Ireland, we have Dervla Collins, who is a medical oncologist at Cork University Hospital, who leads trials there, and is a clinical lecturer at University College Cork. And welcome to Asima Mukopadhyay, who works with patients in India, where she's a consultant in gynecological oncology at the Chittaranjan National Cancer Institute in Calcutta and also in the UK where she is consultant at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead in the north of England. Um, in a moment uh, Asima and Dervla I want to ask you what struck you about the findings in the presentation there but before we start I wonder if by way of introduction I could get each of you to explain who your patients are and, and what your work with them um, involves. Um, Asima who, who do you work with? Well, um, I've got a complex, complicated background, as you can imagine. So I have patients in the UK, um, as well as in India. And I, I think, um, I, I suppose uh, the diversity couldn't have been wider because the hospital that I work in India is a government hospital. The average household income of majority of the, the patients I treat there in ovarian cancer is about $100 a month. So you can imagine the, the kind of disparity um, we have. Um, I am a surgeon by training, but of course I have had a big background with the invention of PARP inhibitors at Newcastle. And it, it really breaks my heart to see we're talking about PARP after PARP, but there is no PARP in many parts of the world. Yes, and that's definitely something uh, we want to discuss. Um, Dervla, um, who do you work with? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm a medical oncologist um, in Ireland, so Cork is in the south of Ireland. So um, my patients are um, uh, women who have been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, um, usually at an advanced stage, unfortunately. And um, I, follow, uh, I look after them through their journey with you know, chemotherapy, um, debulking surgery with uh, the, and, and all these new treatments that are coming on stream. So the maintenance treatments that uh, Dr. Coleman spoke about, the PARP inhibitors and, and the anti-angiogenic agents like Avastin, but then going on from there. And I think, um, you know, what's what's really important is, you know, we, we talk a lot about PARPs and we talk a lot about uh, maintenance treatments, but and there are patients who are doing exceptionally well on these treatments, but there are those and there are many that are not. Um, and I think that is really the, the area we need to be focusing on. And Robert, who, who are your patients? 
So I treat, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the U.S., the gynecologic oncologists are, are very similar that they uh, have both surgical and medical oncology kind of combined practices. I treat um, most, uh, many patients that, that see me for clinical trial. So um, uh, that's probably the bulk of the patients that I see that are coming for uh, either across uh, the GYN spectrum. So uh, ovarian, endometrial, vulva, cervical cancer, vaginal cancer. And Dervla, thinking about the uh, presentation we've just heard there, what, what struck you about the most recent <clears throat> findings and, and developments? So there's no doubt that it's it's really exciting. Um, gynecological cancer research is a really exciting place to be. Um, and, you know, we had been stuck with chemotherapy for such a long period of time. And now we're starting to see you know, these, um, you know, beyond the anti-angiogenics, anti so the Avastins that we're adding a little bit of improvement, we're now seeing PARPs. But even more than that, and I think what Dr. Coleman really touched on is the PARP inhibitor combinations that are coming through. Um, so there's, you know, he spoke about some of the other uh, agents that target the DNA damage repair pathways, which look really promising. Um, but also we've got some really exciting studies coming very soon with obviously combination with immunotherapy, there's been PARP inhibitor and antiangiogenics. Um, so, you know, the, the, the trial landscape is really exciting. Um, on the other side, there's some really simple questions that we still fully haven't kind of figured out um, from a, a, a basic level, even just, you know, who should get PARP inhibitors um, and for how long we should be giving them is, you know, three years of niraparib the same as one or two years of it. So we don't know these questions yet. And I think with trials, sometimes it's it's easier to, to do the trials on the exciting agents and not so easy to do the trials on the more boring scheduling and dosing and all that thing. There's a lovely study, um, Newton, looking at modifications of, of PARP inhibitor uh, dosing and starting at lower doses and tailoring to, to side effects. And they're, you know, they're supposed to be more practical aspect. Um, but I think as well, what you see is you're seeing all these new treatments moving earlier and earlier in the patient's course. Um, and it's leaving, it's like a, a speedboat, leaving this wake behind it, where there's these patients that are now PARP resistant and platinum resistant. And we, we're really running, you know, we're, we're stuck for treatments for them. Yes. And so, um, Asima, what, what struck you listening to the uh, presentation there? Do you feel the same way that there are, there are still some, some trials that haven't been done that we need to do? Oh, no, of course. I mean, as I said, I mean, you know, I'm not a medical oncologist, but I, I can say that, you know, even from a surgical point of view, there's a huge amount of work to be done. And then um, I, I suppose we haven't struck the balance that how much to do or even what is the minimum that we should be doing in what patients. Um, I, I think there's still a huge amount of work to do, but it's promising because, you know, at least you've got a direction in, the, in, 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 a, in a positive way. Yeah, so Rob, Robert, do you feel more over-optimistic? Do you feel optimistic overall that these most recent developments at least mean that things are going in the right direction? Because it has been a long wait for progress, hasn't it, with ovarian cancer? Um. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, yeah, and, and you know, obviously our, our biggest impact uh, is gonna be made in early detection and prevention. But if for those that have been diagnosed, um, I think that prevalence slide I showed you for the US um, population, as you mentioned, um, is, is that hope. Um, it, it has, it, in my, in my you know, professional career, this disease has gone from something that we would consider an orphan disease from the standpoint of regulatory purposes to one that's no longer classifies under that status because it's because the prevalence rates have risen. Now that means that we have a lot of patients around and a lot of them are, are suffering with disease. So there's definitely need to continue to, to expand on that. But these patients weren't there last, last time we, you know, in previous years, they were never made it this far. So, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I do think there's great uh, uh, reason to be optimistic. This disease is, very complicated uh, to treat. This is not like melanoma and lung cancer and bladder cancer, where we where we find you know specific mutations um, outside of BRCA, specific mutations that we can target so easily. This is a copy number derangement uh, uh, cancer, which makes it really hard to target. But we've learned so much, and and as as mentioned, there are more questions than we have patients, but there are the opportunities are there if we do them smartly that we'll be able to make big changes. 
And so with your patients in Ireland, Dervla, how much difference is this making in practice already, um, particularly outside trials, I guess? As a clinician, what sort of difference is it making for them and what you can offer them? Yeah, so I mean, we are we. I mean, we're part of the European Union, so we are fortunate in that we actually can access PARP inhibitors, and I think that that's an important part. Um, and I think the slide that Clara put up earlier on uh, was quite harrowing when you can see how some of these agents are just just not even there, not even you know some chemotherapy, but certainly not as far as PARP inhibitors. Um, but yeah, so in Ireland, we're I suppose we're trying to figure out who. Um, I mean, some of it is very straightforward. You have a BRCA mutation, either, you know, germline or a tumor BRCA mutation, you know, you access a PARP inhibitor. There's, um, there's some more uncertainty about the rest of the population. Um, we do not have access to HRD testing. Um, so pretty much most people are, we're trying to get access for PARP inhibitors for them, but that's obviously not the best way to be going, but it is a fortunate way uh, that I can I can do that for my patients. Um, but what we need is we need better ways of targeting, of knowing the patient populations that will do the best on these treatments. And then obviously where the combinations are going to fit. So, um, you know, the PARP with the anti-angiogenic agents, who needs just a PARP, who needs a PARP plus something else. And, you know, then there's other studies coming with other combinations, which, you know, it's just to see where everything is going to fall. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a busy place, uh, ovarian cancer treatment now. And Asima, you've mentioned access already. How important, since these treatments, the PARP inhibitors can be so transformational, how important is it that they can get to low income countries as well? And is that, how likely is that? Um, if I could show a slide, I mean, just kind of want to share one slide, which I've prepared. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, so basically what I wanted to show that, um, on the left hand side, you can see the trajectory of ovarian cancer, which happens normally in a high resource setting. So they get to get good surgery, then maybe IV chemotherapy, then you get a BRCA testing and then HRD testing, then PARP inhibitors, a treatment of recurrence with a lot of agents, and you've got quality of life questions and then survivorship. If you come to low resource settings where I am working, if you can think in all of them, there is a problem. So in terms of surgery, um, patchy, if you want to give it intraperitoneal chemotherapy, we don't have trained genetic counselors, HRD testing, um, you know, it's not available um, routinely, although there are some mushroom in genomic assays, which is coming around. PARP is not accessible. Pa patient don't live beyond the first progression most of the time to even access any treatment for recurrence. I think the, the survival endpoints are very different. It might be most related to quality adjusted life points at that point, and then survivorship is not well established. So I think what we are doing now is looking into some alternative strategies through our group regional in Eastern India. Um, of course, you know, surgery is going to be the most cost effective intervention, which we need to um, um, uh, rely on. And then if you're wanting to give some interpersonal chemotherapy, then you know, maybe select a subgroup where it's going to work best. Use some alternative strategies for or workforces for genetic counseling. We are a pro a promoting a low cost of the RAD51 academic HRD assay, which is in our hands about $50. We're still in an academic setting, but much cheaper than the, the conventional genomic assays. PARP inhibitors, we have shown in the lab that an intermittent weekly or bi-weekly strategy of a PARP inhibitor is equally good enough. So maybe doing some studies with that. So I'm saying in every level, I think we need to be innovative till a time comes where we access them. And I think we need a real global voice um, to make sure that this big inequality, which is across the board from the top to the bottom trajectory, can be um, addressed in some way. And presumably a lot of your patients aren't in any position to pay for treatment themselves. Um, no, I suppose, you know, in the government hospital where we are working, the surgery is free, you know, some of the things, the carbotaxol, but it's not gone towards the rest of it. So, you know, but maybe there is a, there is a scope if it will become targeted to selected groups or the cost of the treatments can be rationalized and come down, then the government may be able to support a, a segment of population. But that needs a mandate, it needs science, it needs 
rationalizing and um, I suppose the, the pharma in the industry backing to do academic studies with lower dose costs, um, you know, things like that. It's, it's a huge task. And Robert, globally, access is going to be the real issue here, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And already people in the sessions yesterday highlighted the divide there is between low and middle income and high income countries. Uh, I mean, this is just going to be a massive challenge, isn't it? Yeah, and I, but I think Asima brings up a very important point that applies across the board, and that is the use of, uh, of, of tools that would select the patients that would benefit the most. So this is a, an elusive struggle in, in a tumor like ovarian cancer because we don't have um, specific predictive, as opposed to prognostic, biomarkers. Um, PARP uh, and BRCA status is one of the links, one of the rare links that we have between a biomarker, some blood test that we can do or tumor test that we can do that actually is, uh, can link us to a, an effective strategy. And I showed with those, with those curves, or excuse me, those bars in a bar graph that the, that the delta, the difference between those patients who, who had the biomarker and got the drug were substantially different from the patients that had the biomarker and didn't get the drug. So when it comes time, comes time to low resource or any resource in my mind, that's the kind of differential you have to show and, and provide the evidence so that the health ministries look at this as a priority for their population. And so uh, I think all of us need to demonstrate first that there is efficacy, that we can identify who those patients are, and then we need to work globally to provide access, leveraging every tool that we can use. And that includes pharma, foundations, and advocacy, um, just what we're doing today, just getting the information out. So all those things can help us. But our job as investigators is to help to identify who those people are. And Dervla, how much of a challenge is that for you in your work, trying to work out what to give to which person? Oh, I mean, as I said, you know, we, we, we have the bare minimum. So, you know, Dr. Coleman said we have BRCA. That's what I have. And otherwise it's a bit of trial and error. And I know that sounds mm -hmm. terrible, but it's let's try a PARP. But at least I, I can access a PARP, which is, you know, less than a SEMA's patients can. And, and, and all, over the, all over the world, there's such disparities. But even within each country, we know that there are frightening disparities. And we know that, you know, um, even in you know, the US or the UK, uh, and Ireland, they're, you know, patients who are of racial minorities and who have um, lower incomes, they, they find it difficult to access these agents and access clinical trials. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's an, a regional, national, international um, uh, uh, disparity. And exactly, it's all about really trying to, to, to bring, to minimize that big gap between and higher and lower incomes and to get get everybody as a world group like the world ovarian cancer coalition to work together to achieve that and that's the only way it's possible is, is by unity and there's more that uh, i've got more questions as well but there are already um questions um coming in from our audience and i wanted to just put a couple of those and i'll go back to some things i wanted to chat about but uh, one person says all of the talk on drugs on top of more drugs may be a lot for women to cope with. How is it possible to really make sure it's in women's best interests? And I was struck, Robert, that by your slides on side effects, and you, you were saying that some of these can be quite severe. How, how, how bad are they? So, um, you know, in the context of clinical trials where we don't know what the side effect profile are, uh, you know, is and or can be in terms of combinations, um, you know, we, we um, try to uh, uh, grade these particular adverse events as they come on, on trial. And, and remember, this is not an exact science, right? If a patient comes in and has, for instance, abdominal discomfort while they're on a study, we have to make a decision as to whether or not the abdominal discomfort, for instance, is you know, how severe is it? And then is it coming from the drug? Is it coming from the disease? Is it coming from something else that the patient's taking? So it's not a, it's not a very specific science. But what we try to look at are are these adverse events um, interrupting treatment? So I mentioned that in the, in the combination with the Davis-Sertib trial, we had lots of patients getting tremendous benefit, but they were off therapy almost as much time as they were on therapy. So to me, that's not a tolerable regimen, even if it's showing a good outcome. So um, what we're trying to do then is to learn from that study 
and figure out ways like you just heard about maybe even changing the schedule so that patients do not have to experience that. And ultimately, you know, having no side effects, you know, is, is where we want to be, but the disease itself produces it. So it, it's, it's one of those things that um, we have to, you know, and I encourage everybody watching who's on a study or who's on, on an agent um, therapy, that they communicate well with their study team because uh, with their healthcare team, because sometimes we just don't know uh, patients are telling us what, what, you know, what their adverse events are. Yes, and Dervla, there's a related question on this saying, is there an issue about continuing to use treatments for women that we know might be unlikely to help and may actually be de detrimental? Should those women be being directed towards clinical trials at all? Um, Claude, sorry, um, patients shouldn't be directed towards treatment and clinical trials? If those women, if maybe though those continuing to use treatments may not necessarily help them, should they still be being directed towards trials? Well, um, so I think this there's, I mean, there's two aspects that I want to pick up first of all, or after this on Dr. Coleman, what, what he what he mentioned. Um, but I think obviously, I think that treatments that aren't um, that aren't working for a patient or are, are impacting significantly on their quality of life. I think that that's, um, I mean, there's two things that people need. They want to live longer and they also want to live better. And I think that sometimes there's a lot of focus on the first bit and how to, to live longer, mm -hmm. but sometimes that that comes in at a detriment of quality of life. And that is why patient advocacy and patient involvement and patient public involvement in actually trial design and, and, and all these is really, is, is really key. Um, so uh, Dr. Coleman, I, I think mentioned two things about the, the, the treatments. I think it's really, really important is that the, the grading often, you know, we, we say this, this, um, this phrase, you know, well, grade three or four adverse events. And that, you know, we take that to mean, oh, they're the most serious. So they're the most important, but actually, Grade two nausea going on for a couple of months is pretty horrific. Uh, grade two Terrible. diarrhea, I wouldn't wish it on an enemy. So um, <laughs> I think that in, in, real, in the real world, I think that these treatments are probably harder to tolerate than, than might be um, evident from the clinical trials. Also, the patients who enroll on clinical trials are the, the they're the fittest patients usually they're usually the youngest they're often they're the strongest the fittest um, and they don't reflect my my 80 year old lady who's come into me and is 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 really struggling on her PARP inhibitor um, because of you know nausea or because of fatigue she's no energy to do her gardening that she loved and I think that this is really an important aspect of of treatments and um, and none of these treatments are easy to to you know they, they wouldn't even PARP inhibitors on their own and um, they're not as as Dr. Coleman said a walk in the park and um, they they have their challenges. And Asima, I'm interested in your view on this. Is, are we, is there a danger of putting too much emphasis on drugs after drugs after drugs? I, I suppose it depends on the patient because um, in India, um, the hospital where I'm working, the median age of ovarian cancer patients I see is 42. So um, it's, whereas it's 65 in the UK. So when I treat an 80 year old in the UK, it's very different. Sometimes they have quality of life and points, but when you are treating a mother of two at an age of 40 or 45, I think they'd want to live each day. And I think it's very important to understand. Um, I mean, they often underreport the symptoms. They just don't want to tell about it. Um, so it's it's very it's very different. And I think one of the main importance of patient advocacy should be to make sure that women have voice to tell what they want, what is their more, what, what is their preference as terms of endpoints. And Rob, from your presentation, it does sound as if most of the progress has been with PARP inhibitors, but are there other areas of research where there might be promise which shouldn't be dismissed? Is there a risk of going or, you know, too much in that direction? Are there other things too? Oh, I think there's, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, our, our, our testing a lot, there's a lot, and I didn't present it because we were just looking it up, at, you know, kind of updates, but there's a lot of work being done in recurrent um, patient populations as a way to identify, you know, the most promising agents that would be moved up earlier and earlier in, in treatment. Um, because ultimately we'd like to get the most effective therapies to the patients as early as possible. 
so I mentioned one class of drug, which has a lot of promise, which is the antibody drug conjugates. And this is a class that uh, we should hear some updated information about very soon. But there are a number of other of these agents being done alone and in combination uh, to potentially even replace toxic medicines that, are, that we give now as standard of care for frontline treatment. So um, that's just one, but you know, as we get back into the biology of this cancer, we start to understand multiple different points of, of vulnerability. And so a lot of our trials that, uh, that are ongoing right now are testing agents that are trying to target these specific vulnerabilities. Uh, and it, there's a lot, I mean, it's a lot there, but you know, we have to go through this process of, of designing informative clinical trials. Uh, we just can't just try it, you know, and hope that uh, you know we expose a bunch of patients that we don't think are going to going to benefit. We have to really be thoughtful about that because uh, the that resource is so is so precious and so limited. And Robert, I wanted to ask you. You mentioned in your presentation about how sometimes you can uh, treat people with PARP inhibitors twice, and it will be uh, yeah. will work again a second time. But other times you can't. Do you have, do we have any idea why why that mechanism might be so different for different people on different occasions? Yeah, we do. We actually have quite a bit of information about this and it continues to emerge, but we understand that there are um, under this kind of, if you think about it as selective pressure, the tumors adapt to what that injury, uh, you know, what that inability is and, and they, they're they very smart. So uh, through a process of, you know, selective pressure, uh, the ones that aren't completely killed uh, through this process, they, they survive and proliferate. And we know that there are at least 10 different mechanisms for why patients should be who you would expect to respond to a part like a BRCA, a, a patient with a BRCA uh, a tumor, um, uh, where a second mutation actually occurs within the tumor. So it restores the normal kind of protein um, development or read uh, out, of that, out of that DNA. And so that protein is around even though there's a mutation and a second mutation. So, um, but there's loss of target, there's pumping the drug out, there's all these different mechanisms that we've come to learn. And so we, indeed, we're, we're, that's what that's the focus of these combination strategies is a way to try to see if we can re-break that machinery so that we can take advantage of it. And Asima, we've talked a lot about um, developments in drugs. Um, what about surgery? Are you seeing any developments in surgery? Well, I think the simple principle we are still struggling to get is to take all the disease out. And I mean, you know, there's a lack of training all around the world, um, you know, I think I would really like to see a day when we really don't need to do these eight to 10 hour procedures, you know, but um, I, I'm, I don't think it's, it's far, uh, far away, still possibly the best thing to do. But I think one of the things which I, I suppose, I, I think it's relevant in low middle income countries because it's the cheapest, is to again think about the benefits of uh, intraperitoneal chemotherapy or HIPEC and things, because all those benefits were nullified when you added BEV or PARP and things like that. But I suppose that three months benefit of BEV, if that can be given by HIPEC, then I mean, these are important questions, especially for populations where they do not have access. And I think it, it's time that we need to think about those angles as well, especially in biologically stratified groups. Is there research going on in how to improve surgery or how to develop more specialist um, centres for it? Um, yes, there are group surgical programmes, uh, training and all. So that's a training research point of view. I think there are some trials on HIPEC which are I mean, happening all around the world. So hopefully we will get some idea about which the research direction in surgery goes. But I mean, me as a surgeon, when I started working with PARP, I used to really think that we possibly, I don't need to do these surgeries when I finished my training in research. But I think 10 years down the line, I, I've come back to the conclusion that no matter, I mean, you, you really need to do a good surgery and then followed by a good biology and a biologic. I think that's what maybe the best outcome would be. And when you don't have, then you have to think about alternatives. But I mean, these surgeries are really complicated. They, and I really hope there will be one day like a gestational trophoblastic tumor when everything is dis disappeared with chemotherapy, who knows?
Yeah, so that would that would be a good day. And um, there's lots of questions coming in on the chat. Do do put more questions um, in there if you want to. Um, and there's a question, an interesting question about COVID that I'd like to put to all three of you actually, which was, have, have what setback? Have you seen any setbacks as a as a result of COVID to what you've been able to offer and how you're doing that, uh, um, Dervla? Um, yeah, so there's probably two important points about this. I mean, ovarian cancer is already a cancer that is diagnosed late and um, patients often ignore the symptoms their family um, um, their family um, doctor or their general practitioner sometimes overlooks the you know the, the, the symptom of something else um, and so these the, the problem I think with COVID is that there was a big their patients were not seeking medical attention. They were not going to hospitals or their general practitioner for checkups. And I do, I do fear that we're going to see that knocked on. And I think we're, we, you can see that in some of the, in, in, in our own MDTs that we're presenting, there seems to be this upslope of more advanced disease than we would probably be normally expecting. Um, but again, I haven't seen data on that yet, certainly from on, on our side. Um, the um, I suppose the the, the, the second um, the second aspect about COVID is the drugs and accessing the drugs. Now we were lucky that we managed to keep a lot of things up and running. It does um, it, that didn't happen globally around the world. There was big changes. Um, access to clinical trials was was affected. Um, I think the, the PARP inhibitors and the fact that they're oral, I think that might have helped. But still, they do need you know regular monitoring. Um, but uh, most patients, certainly in my practice, stayed on treatment. Robert, what impact have you seen? Well, you know, I, I actually, uh, you know, was in, in an academic setting uh, and then transitioned to a community-based setting, research setting. So it was interesting to see this effect. We, there's been two things that we've documented. One is that we, that they're in the, in the height of the COVID pandemic when we were limited on OR more patients were transitioned into new adjuvant therapy as part of their primary treatment. And so with that came, we expect to see, as, as was already mentioned, we expect to see that there may be some diminution in long-term outcomes because of that strategy. In other words, taking patients who would have been good surgical candidates for primary therapy uh, were delayed uh, or didn't have surgery at all. Uh, so we might see that impact as a cohort. But the other thing that I noticed was that uh, because of the need to keep space available for patients having adverse events from our clinical trials is we put a hold on enrollment in the academic world and transition that to the community setting. And so actually as part of my you know, responsibility as you know, running clinical trials within the community-based setting, we actually did not see a diminution in patients uh, accessing clinical trials in the community. Um, still had to deal with the surgical aspect, but we were able to keep up our enrollment on clinical trial both last year and this year. So, um, so it's a little bit, it's differentially impacted by, uh, you know, some of the resources and the issues that COVID is, is yeah. imp impacting us. Yeah. And Asima, what about with you in, in India and in the UK? Um, well, I suppose I was in both at the times. Um, in India, um, I suppose, you know, because we didn't have access to all these PARP inhibitors and clinical trials and all, so people underwent surgery. Um, so fortunately, we could keep those services open. But there is something I noticed that because patients were coming possibly more later than we usually see, there's a lot more disease burden, more difficulty surgery, a very high um, inflammatory um, response during surgery for people who had previous COVID, infiltrative patterns of disease more often, people having COVID-related cardiopathy and you know, all the medical problems which sometimes impacted on the post-operative outcome. So the surgical paradigm always also has been quite different from what you normally see. Um, and in, in the UK, of course, you know, systems were much better in place, but majority of patients underwent neoadjuvant chemo um, and we possibly would see the data in the, in the near future. But um, that's how, but as a surgeon, I definitely think that the COVID related changes have impacted even on the surgical outcome. Now, there's a question here, somebody asking, we, we've been talking about developments in treatment. Have there been any developments in diagnosis over the last uh, year or so? Um, Dervla, could you take that? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we've really struggled with, um, I suppose, screening for ovarian cancer and trying to um, identify 
um, techniques or methods in which we might be able to pick up uh, ovarian cancer earlier. And um, I mean, the focus has really been on awareness, education, education of the public, education of um, the, I suppose, the first responders. So the family uh, practice doctors and the general practitioners. I, I think that that's been, um, um, it, it, it's not by any means, you know, um, as good as it, 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 as we would like it to be, but there's definitely been headway and there's been some excellent um, internationally, also nationally in Ireland, there's been some really excellent um, suppose advertising or marketing campaigns, uh, especially around World Ovarian Day, just to try and encourage patients to um, to notice some of the more vague symptoms that ovarian cancer to try and you know I suppose I, to, to be diagnosed earlier um, so I mean there there is some research uh, ticking away in the background looking at you know ways in which we might be able to detect tumor circulating in the blood there is there is work being done on this but there's nothing that we have in the real world at the moment but hopefully that's the future. And here's a question for uh, Robert. As president of the IGCS, how important is it to have a global strategy for ovarian cancer? Oh, well, we think, you know, you know, addressing disparities is one of the our major, it's actually the focus of what we do as an organization. Uh, we have a health disparities statement that we use to guide all of our programmatic um, uh, programs and our programmatic strategy going forward. So, so we are actually addressing this and um, uh, in, in trying to understand ways to standardize uh, and uh, training, which is also one of the questions that came up, uh, is there opportunities to improve training, uh, but also to improve access. And so some of this is just visibility, identifying the problem, making it uh, visible. Uh, and the IGCS as an international organization is really one of the very few places that we can bring this all together. So we've assembled a team uh, uh, already uh, that will be represented by our uh, by our, our, our represent, represented by our individuals that actually cover many parts of the world with various different uh, resource settings to help identify, first of all, what we can do and ultimately um, get that word out there and address those specific uh, solutions. And Asima, there's an interesting question here saying what steps could be taken by the global community, by scientists or by patient organizations to try to accelerate progress over the next five years? What, what, would, what can they do? I think some of them I might have covered in the slides. I think we just need to think about innovative strategies and I think patient selection is going to be the key. Mm. We can't be affording to give PARP inhibitors to HR proficient patients who are not going to benefit from it. I think that's the first 50% patient, 50 patients identified who will benefit from the most important discovery in ovarian cancer of the last decade. Um, yeah, and then think about those reducing schedules, alternative schedules. I mean, even I think the pharmacogenomic studies we haven't done, all the data we are extrapolating from women in the West who have twice the body weight of women residing in many parts of the world. So, you know, maybe they just need lower dose anyway. I mean, you know, these are the very important, or I mean, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking that there are so many ways to think about, thinking about why are people so younger in this population? Is it the second hit of BRCA gene happening many much earlier because of epigenetic changes? You know, there are, there are a lot of questions and I, I think, one of the most important things which might we will need to do is to um, empower the research community and scientists to come up with their local problem and answers, not just copying what's being done in West and then trying to email, email it in New York setting. I think that's that's a very important thing to do. Yeah, so really important to consider different settings. And here's, here's a question uh, saying uh, they're interested in your views on how to make clinical trials more accessible to more women. But is geographical diversity an insoluble problem? Is, is there any way of making, making it so that more women can take part in trials wherever they live? Um, Dervla, what would you say to that? Yeah, so this is from an Irish perspective, this is huge at the moment for us. So we're currently hitting 2% of our population are enrolling onto clinical trials, which is way below what we should have. And um, I mean, in fact, if we just focus on gynecological cancers, I mean, we've had a very, um, I suppose, sparse portfolio to offer our patients until maybe four or five years ago, um, where we've, we've really started to increase. But this is um, a real focus. And there's, I suppose, there's 
a number of ways in which we can improve um, access to patients or patients to trials. Some of that is, is you know, improving referral networks. Um, Ireland is a small country. I know the United States has a long history of patients traveling across the country to clinical trials in, in New York or Texas or, mm -hmm. you know, other, other places. But in Ireland, we you can drive from the top to the bottom in about six hours. So um, so we should be really good at moving uh, mm -hmm. patients around the country. And again, this is we need to work harder at this. We also I think we, in Europe, we don't maybe advertise or, or you know, market clinical trials as much as we sh should and, um, you know, make aware that they're open, they're available. Get, and, and I think also um, in enabling patients and empowering patients to go and look for this information um, and, and to have websites that are available for them to access, I think is also a really important part. But access to clinical trials, we know is a key part of cancer care and patients who have access to trials tend to do better. So um, it is important. So that's interesting, Robert. Is it, is it the case then that in the US people will travel across the, you know, the continent, if you like, to get to take part in trials? They absolutely will. Um, but that, but even though that's a desire and we do see people doing that, it is not easy. And you can imagine uh, patients that are on studies that have weekly therapy or, or maybe two or three times per week therapy, it's a huge burden and cost mm. um, uh, to, 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 to have that happen. So, um, so you know, we, uh, uh, everything that was mentioned is absolutely true. We, we know we have documented data that just having a, getting care in a center that actually has a clinical research program, even if they don't go on trial, do better. So there is, there is, there is something to be said about standing up research programs, which is what I'm trying to do in the community setting all across the country. Here's a nice uh, question to end with from someone in the audience, which is what are the panel's hopes for this next year? Not pie in the sky hopes, but realistic hopes for what will happen in the next year. Um, uh, Asima, what would you like to see in the next year? Access of PARP inhibitors globally. Dervila, what would you like to see? Any oh. time testing. <laughs> yeah, so much. Testing. It's it's hard it's hard to to pick one thing that I am um, that 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 I want to see. Um, I think I'm looking forward to the to um the immunotherapy combinations, the immune, in particular the immunotherapy PARP inhibitor combinations. So I think that um that's 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 on a trial level. That's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Robert, in the next year, what are you looking forward to, hoping for? Yeah, I believe in yeah. I, I, in the next year, I think we will have our uh, AD, first ADC. Um, I think this will be, will be positive and I'm hopeful that that will be uh, available to, uh, to prescribe. So I think that will be an, an add another uh, asset to our armamentarian. Well, let's hope that all those things happen. So thank you very much to Asima Mukhopadhyay, Dervla Collins and Robert Coleman. Absolutely fascinating there. And I wish everyone uh, the very best of luck in tackling ovarian cancer and, and everyone in the audience as well. And let's hope all those things happen next year and that we start to see survival rates improve all over the world. And if, if we do, I should remember today and all the inspirational things that we have heard. Um, so thank you, everybody. Now, the main meeting resumes again at 4 p.m. UTC with the session on charting our course for the future. But there's a treat for you in the meantime with a health breakout session with the Dempsey Centre. So if you'd like to go to that, you go to that by clicking on the link in the panel on the left of your screen where they will take you through some interesting things. Sounds very good to me. Um, but if not, do join again at 4 o'clock. Thank you again to the panel. I'm Claudia Hammond. Thank you very much for having me here today. Bye bye.